we don't have Pete to uh, tell uh, the the end of a joke, so we'll just go <laughs> with "Welcome to the Lovecraft Using Podcast." And today is February the ninth, two thousand twenty. Man, I almost said two thousand nineteen. Um, and we we actually have two guests today. Uh, Jason, Jason is Wallach. Am I spelling? Am I saying that right? Yes, Wallach. Okay, thanks. Uh, you're a composer, right? And you've got some Lovecraftian music that you've composed quite a bit, actually. Uh, uh, yes. And other other types of music. And you were on the schedule. And then uh, I've got Mary. Tell me how to pronounce your last <laughs> name so I don't screw it. San Giovanni. San Giovanni. Okay, I was going to say mm-hmm. San Giovanni, so that's not right. Okay, so San Giovanni. <laughs> uh, and Mary San Giovanni, uh, I, I read an article of hers. Is that your local paper? Or... Uh, no, I think, uh, I, I get the impression that it's more like a national kind of thing. It's mostly oh, okay. an online kind of thing. Um, and Sandra Rutan, who, who runs the, the editing portion that uh, hired me and a couple other writers to, to do regular columns. Mm-hmm. She's a huge supporter of, and she's a writer herself, and she's just a huge supporter of, uh, you know, women writers and, and horror and, and right. really discussing, like, what's going on in the business. So it's it's a really cool uh, little paper there. Well, anyway, to the audience, what happened was I saw, I saw somebody linked to it from Facebook, I, I think, and I read this article that you wrote, uh, it's dated February the 6th, and so I emailed Mary, you know, and I said, I know this is last minute, but, you know, uh, can you come on, after we talk to Jason for a bit, can you come on and talk about the article? And, of course, February is Women in Horror Month, and um, and she said yes, thankfully. So thanks for being here. <laughs> thanks so, for having me. Uh, why don't we do our usual introductions, and Matt can tell the audience what the prize is. And then we will we'll talk to Jason for a bit, and then we'll talk to Mary, uh, if that works for both of you. Sure. Um, I'm Mike. I'm Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing. Um, and why don't we have Ben go next? I'm Ben Handelman. I'm just a fan. And Jason, that that is my synthesizer. There, it's a Euro rack. Wow, that's great nice. chord management there. Great chord management. I could t- <laughs> take a snapshot really. of that for me so I can... <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I can rib him about tech stuff because he's the reason why we still have a show. Or at least <laughs> at least the reason why it didn't take six months to, to, to have a show after Google exactly. Hangouts committed suicide. Uh, Rick... <laughs> Rick Lay, a writer who discovered that in seven months, will probably have a grandson. Yay! Congratulations! Congratulations! All right, man. That's great. Congratulations. Um, Rick is also a writer. Go to ricklay.com, L-A-I, and it'll forward you to his Amazon page. Uh, I did that for him a while back, and so that's just an easy way to to uh, look at his work. Um Matthew Carpenter, how about you? Hi, I'm I'm mostly noted for being a sycophantic hanger-on, but um, <laughs> I I um, run the easy movie night when we have it. We had a great movie last night, surprisingly so, called Headcount. Uh, we're still trying to decide what we're going to do next week um, if we even have one because of Valentine's Day. The prize this week is a biography of Lovecraft by Charlotte Montague. It is broken up into little snippets, and it has tons of photographs and art, and uh, it's very readable. It is actually a decent biography. Of course, it's not Joshi's 3,000-pound I Am Providence, but, you know, if you keep this in your, um, I don't know, water closet, it gives you something to read if you don't have anything else to do. Water Um, closet? So so if you want this Is that where you get on the AOL, you know, while you're in the water closet? (laughs) Um, so if you want this book, and I'd never send it to Mike now because he's such a bastard, um, <laughs> you uh, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put Montague in the title. It's a nice hardcover volume, pretty good read. Wow, make it hard on everybody. How do you spell Montague? Montague, like, come on, like Capula and Montague? Good grief. Um, I, I have a suggestion for you, but I won't 
talk about it now for for next Saturday's uh, movie night. I'll I'll talk about it later after we talk to All the right, guests. All right, cool. Uh, both of our guests here, please feel free when we're done talking to you to leave if you got other things going on, and also please feel more than free to stay the entire time and and be geeks like us and talk about <laughs> horror stuff. So uh, I'm gonna. Uh, did I get everybody besides the guests? I think I did. No, Bridget. Sorry, I, the, this new the, uh, with Zoom, you got to keep scrolling over to make sure you get everybody. Oh, hi, so. uh, hi. I'm Bridget Brenmark. Um, I write music and I'm an artist. And uh, I guess Pete's not on the show, so I'm taking the uh, pillow in bed slot for this uh, podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Did you see what I posted on Facebook today of him? A, a yeah. s screen <laughs> screenshot of him holding up um, uh, the Shape of Water. Um, so, yeah, he, yeah, his daughter is actually, his, it's his daughter's birthday today, so, um, that's why he's not here. So, so, so Rick's going to have a grand person. Um, they probably don't know boy or girl yet, do they? Not this early. No, no, they know it's probably going to be a boy. Oh, they do. Okay. Well, again, congratulations, man. Um... Mary, could you give us just a real brief intro, and then we'll talk to Jason, and then we'll flip back over to you. Sure. Um, my name is Mary San Giovanni. I've been writing for almost 20 years now in horror and supernatural thrillers. Primarily, most of the stuff that I've done has been uh, at least bordering on cosmic horror, if not straight up cosmic horror kind of uh, kind of horror fiction. And I currently am a co-host on The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And I do my own podcast called Cosmic Shenanigans, in which I look at different things in pop culture and uh, books, movies, video games, comic books, music, uh, pretty much anything, even, even urban legends that I can equate to cosmic horror and discuss how it fits into the, you know, the, the broader cosmic horror body of entertainment that's out there wow I, i'm that sounds great I, I i did not know about this at all that's a great title for a podcast too oh, thank you so, <laughs> we I, do, it's fun it's, it's <laughs> a little bit little bit academic and just a little bit silly and yeah. we just try to cover anything that um anything that i feel that i can legitimately uh basically describe as cosmic horror and and link to you know either the tropes or the way the tropes have been subverted in modern cosmic horror. It's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I assume it's on the in the usual places like Spotify yep. and iTunes and all that. So, Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, cosmic shenanigans. Cosmic oh, shenanigans. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jason. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about you, and then let's talk about your music. Um, about me. Uh, well, um, <laughs> putting you on the spot, aren't I? A little bit. Uh, what can I say? Do you, um, do, do you just compose? Do you have a day job, that sort of thing? Oh, I, yeah, I do have a day job. Okay. Uh, currently a pharmacy technician. Oh, okay. Right. I work for, work for a fertility, uh, pharmacy as a matter of fact. And, um, here in Massachusetts and, um, I have uh, three children, and I've got a stepdaughter, which I don't think of it that way, but... And at least two Cthulhu's to your right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh. Babies of a different sort. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, yeah, yeah well, let me um, actually keep that up, and I'll put you on the screen for the uh, viewers. There you go. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great oh, one. Oh, cool. I haven't, I haven't seen yeah. that one before. Yeah, that's from the uh, mysterious package company, the Creative Cthulhu. Oh, yeah. I'm currently doing some advertising for them. They've got yeah. some really, really cool stuff. They uh, do. They got some this... King and Yellow stuff, too. Oh, yeah. Yep. I would love to do the King and Yellow one. Yeah. Actually, uh, actually they sent it to me. Um, the, the first, they send this little invitation thing. And then they... then. Now I've got this huge box over here, and my son, he's 17, and he loves unboxing stuff. So what we're going to do for those guys is I'm going to film him unboxing the 
the king and yellow thing sometime nice. in the next cool. couple of weeks yeah so did they send you an invitation to the play is that what that first little yes yeah yes absolutely that's exactly what it was yeah yeah oh that's so. fantastic they have a lot of uh really good ones that look really interesting yeah uh, that one and the, and the the cthulhu one i think would be a lot of fun yeah and uh, did you guys ever catch um online um an ad from them where neil patrick harris is pretending somebody's after him he's he's a fan of the mysterious <laughs> package company you could probably find it on youtube or something but he's like he's like talking to the camera like i am right now and he's like did you hear that you know that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> it's great oh that's awesome <laughs> He strikes me as somebody who probably has a really great sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, probably so. Uh, Jason, okay, so tell me, I imagine you've been into music from an early age, is that right, or or no? Yeah, um, really what got me into music was uh, two videos in particular. I used to watch uh, HBO video jukebox way back in the day, mm -hmm. and... Um, Two videos in particular really caught my attention, and one was uh, Gary Newman's Cars, and another was um, with David Bowie's Ashes to Ashes, and they had um, both those tracks had a very profound effect on me uh, emotionally, and so I've always been wanting to get into synthesizers and make strange sounds, and and it kind of went from there and. The Unquiet Void actually started um, started that in 1989 when I was 15. And I've been doing it ever since. Oh God, you were 15 in 89. Yeah. Oh, crap, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay, so let me ask you this: You've got some music up on SoundCloud, right? If, mm -hmm. I assume you could just Google Unquiet Void and SoundCloud, and a person would come to it. Are these yeah. are these samples? Because you know, you sent me this which is really really cool and you sent me this which is cool and for those listening later um this one's the unquiet void where black stars rise and this one is the secret i don't know because i can't read it <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah i got some hate for that <laughs> hate really why well no just like uh, what what is this font i can't read it oh oh yeah okay um so are, are those basically samples online on soundcloud yes okay um mm -hmm. well i would encourage people to listen to those um i listened to a few of those samples in in bed a couple of times at night you know as you're going to sleep um as i was going to sleep and you know the lights are off and everything and sure. it it's it's real effective music um well, thank you how how did you get into Lovecraft or when, and then how did you decide to mesh those two things? Um, let's see. Lovecraft has actually always somehow been a part of my life in some aspect or another. Mm -hmm. um, when, I mean, my earliest, I think, recollection would be when I was, a, I was in junior high and i would go into my brother's room sneak you know sneak cds out of his room and i would see these just these books just kind of scattered around his uh, dresser and you know it was the ones uh oh god i can't remember but it was like a really weird artwork and um that no, the michael whelan is that right guys yes yeah. yes yes and uh i would see the 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 story titles and you know my brother and i would sneak out to movies um in New we lived on long island that's where we're from <clears throat> we would sneak out to like from beyond and um i was just kind of you know it was all you know slashers and so on and so forth but then came across like reanimator and from beyond and i'm like was kind of thinking you know who's writing these stories these are pretty out there you know yeah. <laughs> and um so Lovecraft really caught my attention. I've always been into monsters, as far as I know, and uh, monster movies. Harry, how big Harry Hazard fan, um, and so once I started 
going with the music i used to write a lot of like orchestral stuff and um a lot of like song based music mm -hmm. and in 2000 um i had uh i don't know my first run in with uh, uh you know anxiety or a panic attack or whatever that is right. it was terrible it was terrible and so i picked up uh, what did i do to ease that i picked up uh, lovecraft a life um oh, you know, yeah. by, uh, yoshi and i started reading that and i realized um in order for me to like get into a project i have to like have a really like intimate connection with it and i think that book kind of opened me up to who he was as a person uh, not the, yeah, not completely. I didn't know he was, you know. Was I was, I was wondering so if, uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you were to go, we're going to go with, you know, you were feeling anxious, and then you discover Lovecraft, so you realize everything is pointless, so the anxiety goes away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that that would have been perfect too. So, um, but I think you know, I, I read the shadow over in smith in um 1996 and it was right around the time that carpenters at the mountains <gasps> oh i'm sorry in the mouth of madness came out yeah and, my favorite uh, movie sorry yeah, that's just my favorite movie of all time it, no, it's jump, a great movie jump in whenever you want yeah great movie and um so that story really freaked me out a little bit but um so anyways uh it, it just it stays with you it the way he writes what he writes it just it, it sticks you know yeah um and you just carry it with you until the right time when um you know after i had this experience i started uh reading that book and i realized like his you know grandfather was rich uh my grandfather was wealthy he was self-made um he went from riches to rags which i wouldn't say i lived in rags but i lived with my mother and brother out in the midwest and uh would visit my grandparents you know during the summer and so it was two very level different levels of uh you know yeah. uh, financial stability anyways um he had a love-hate relationship with his mother and at one point you know that was the case uh with me um although she never dressed me up like a girl and said i was stupid um so <laughs> there's that <laughs> you know but um so there were these these strange little connections and uh, you know i started really reading his work and then i saw dagon when that came out and i was really anxious for that because that was a movie that never got made in you know 88 or not yeah 88 or 89 when he he was going to follow up uh from beyond yeah i i and think he, that's he one of the better lovecraftian adaptations out there yeah i i'm yeah. very fond of it i really am yeah um and so then uh when i saw that movie it made me kind of take a step back and say well wait a second he's not just writing stories he's painting a much bigger picture here and that really interested me i had a very different experience with reading the shadow over in smith that i did watching dagon and i realized that's when i realized how susceptible lovecraft was to adaptation and um so i wanted to kind of share my experience having read the shadow over in smith and that's uh that turned out to be um uh the first uh, album i released in 2004 was poison dreams so that that's how that came about you know what i like about your music is uh i've sent i i'm i'm, I'm sent a lot of samples of, of things or book arcs um music whatever you know what have you uh a lot of the music that i've been sent uh that's you know quote lovecraftian is this heavy metal stuff and nothing wrong with heavy metal it's not my thing no. but yeah. It, it it didn't feel like Lovecraft to me. Now your music sort of reminded me when I was younger, uh, a long time ago, late at night listening to, you know, NPR and Steve Roach had his stuff on, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, I, I have a question if I can yeah. just step in for a second. So what is your training in music? Did you study composition somewhere? Were you a performing artist at some point? Um, I took recorder lessons once. Uh, and that, so it's all self-taught. 
uh, yes, it's it's all self-taught. It's all um, kind of my uh, just imagination and my my energy and my um, just um, my love of creating sounds and music. I mean, that's that's really all I can. Uh, it it sounds so like. Well, the thing is, though, you started, uh, did you start on a particular instrument or were you always like on keyboard synthesizers? Yeah. Um, synthesizers. So I went, I graduated. I, well, actually, it's funny because I had like little Casio keyboards when I was little mm -hmm. and I love those things, but they just didn't take me where I wanted to go. And uh, so then I played bass for a little while because uh, I, I just wanted to learn that. Took took some lessons, but um I was so, you know, the difference between like music, how they teach you and, you know, classical music and then me sort of being turned on to uh, things like four, like early 4AD, the 4AD label um, in England uh, and uh, bands like uh, Dead Can Dance and Clan of Zymox and, you know, Birthday Party, things like that. I mean, it really just took me in a very different direction um and then it just got to a point where i didn't want to emulate any kind of music i didn't want to you know i mean that's that's so prevalent in music now i mean you can't turn on the radio without I, me anyways without hearing something that sounds exactly like somebody else yeah that's true oh, and I've, I've, I've actually I just, i've heard that uh, quite a few of the top hits on the radio are all written by just like a half a dozen people that all the artists go to for their music and that's right uh, one of the reasons yeah I, nobody i mean if, it's like nobody comp composes their own music anymore in large part ben? and if and, i can just jump in here real quick so, um so jason it sounds like to me what you're describing is a lot of what um Buchlock talked about so when the synthesizer was sort of simultaneously invented in two places you had robert moog on the east coast mm -hmm. you had don buchla on the west coast and while Robert Moog was trying to um, recreate electronically normal musical instruments and sounds like the organ and such like that, sure. uh, Don Buchla was like, I'm just gonna make noise and learn how to shape it and mess with it. Yeah. And that, and so he, his whole thing, he actually thought, um, so Switched on Bach was the first big synthesizer album, right? Just you took a bunch of box music and you made it with a, um, a Moog uh, modular synthesizer and mm -hmm. it was it was a huge seller and everything and Don Buchel actually thought that actually hurt music because you could do so much more with these instruments that you could never do with the traditional piano or organ or any of these things sure yeah so the idea is don't create classical music with this new instrument create completely new music that's never existed before is that right. kind of what you're talking about yeah, it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's it's far more interesting to me to know the rules and break them um, than it is for me to just f follow the rules. I mean, it's, you know, um, but there's, you know, but there's also, there's difference because it comes from a very emotional place also. Um, it's not just cold cosmic horror, you know, it's, it's not like that at, at all. Um, it's very it's very much rooted in in experiences you know that I've had. Um, it's very like an emotional upheaval, if you will. Um, and you know, at some points, getting the right textures, the right movements, the right volumes, just it, it's a very precise thing. It's and everything has its place. Everything's there for a reason. So you can't just dis dismiss it as noise um, properly, anyways. But I mean, I'm sure there's people that could, but, <laughs> but, well, um, you know, I think like Steve Roach, he's, he was so much better, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and now it seems like to me, whenever I hear something of his, he, that he just basically sat down to the keyboard and, you know, to see what came out, if that makes sense. Um, and and that may be the case. I, yeah, I'm but not sure. you're, I'm not you're putting a lot of thought into what you created. And mm -hmm. It it also sounds to me like you know. So you're you discover Lovecraft. If you're an artist, you know, like Dave Felton or Nick Gucker or or whoever, you create art. If you're a writer, 
then maybe you write some cosmic horror or weird fiction or straight up Lovecraftian stuff. But if you're a musician and, and mus musically inclined like you are, mm -hmm. then that's then that's what you come up with. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what I have at you know my disposal. Um, now, for instance, you mentioned something you know putting thought into these projects. Yeah, I can't even describe the amount of work that I do. Uh, even before I even touch uh, the synthesizer uh, to make one of these albums. I mean, it's got to be, you know, conceptually, when I started doing the Lovecraft con uh, concept albums, it was um, something that has to hit me. You have to have that um, sort of eureka moment with it, you know. It's, it's just got to hit you in the right way. And then you have to figure out how to do it. You have to figure out, okay, well, here's like uh, Poison Dreams, from it, for instance, since we talked about that. It was, so, da you know, Dagon and Shadow Over and Smith, and it was the kind of bookending them in the way that, in a similar way that Stuart Gordon did for his film Dagon. But it was kind of like, okay, well, how do I get from A to B? And um, since Dagon was published in 1917, um, Shadow Over Innsmouth was 35, 36, uh, one of those. Uh, I know it was the last thing that he wrote and published before he died. Um, 1926, right in between and in chronological order is Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot about the Necronomicon. It's got a lot about uh, the dreams, how, how the psychic uh, messages are passed through dreams. And so then you go back to Dagon and it you know, has this character waking up on the beach from one of these horrible dreams on this island that was shifted up where he's going to discover this, you know, like have this horrible encounter. So I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. Then how do I, you know, get from Call of Cthulhu to uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth? And that was that New Zealand newspaper article where they found the, um, you know, everyone dead on the boat except for the one guy, you know, muttering in you know incomprehensibly and holding those idols and i'm like okay so that's how i'm gonna get there and then it just kind of i just kind of mapped it out like a film and so that everything i did for those tracks every layer is is a movement towards the end goal which was that album was resurrecting cthulhu and um so that's in the inter truly in the amazing. All the all all that you're describing. That's yeah, a lot of work, yeah. And then not only that, it was just kind of like, well, okay, so this character from Dagon, you know, he's World War Two, uh, from the story. Well, Obed Marsh was a captain in World War Two, so hey, maybe this is how the whole Innsmith thing got started, you know. And it was just kind of piecing. As long as you're, you know, as long as you're. I believe true to the spirit of the work um, and you work from that uh, that body um, you know it's got to be it's got to be a workable thing it's got to make sense yeah and uh, and so that's how I how I did that and it was really just mapping it out and then was like oh great now I have to I have to make this sound like something <laughs> and uh that that in and of itself was, uh, you know, for so, all of them, it's been pretty pretty wild. So I want to move on to Mary in a minute, but I, I want to ask you for those mm -hmm. who are, are that hopefully we're making aware of you for the first time. Um, where do they go to purchase your music, and how can they purchase it? Is it all CD, or can they get it MP3 download that type of thing? You yeah, know? there's a there's a Bandcamp page. Okay. And, uh, to be uh, clear, I linked this in the YouTube chat, um, both the SoundCloud so people can listen to the demos he's put up. And then I also linked the Bandcamp page there. And then Matt has pasted the, and uh, actually Kat, Joe Pulver's wife, has been linking a bunch of this stuff in the <laughs> Facebook group for us. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I posted a link uh, in, the, in the show notes here on YouTube. And if you're listening later and listening to the audio version, uh, you'll see I'll do the same thing there too. So, um, uh, and then CD yeah. from the from the regular website, which is uh, 
uh, www.tuqvweb.com. Although that store, the store is a little weird. It tends to add like extra shipping, which people get in touch with me and we just do away with that. So I think I, I have to just get rid of that store and just put up PayPal links or something. Let's go backward. Yeah. Uh, so for now, you prefer people went to, to Bandcamp? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, sure. So so if they Google the Unquiet Void and Bandcamp, I, I imagine it'll probably take, it, take them right to it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you ever do like uh, live ex- uh, performances or go to places and give <coughs> lectures? Lectures, I have not. Um, live. Matt gives live a lot of per- lectures on this show. <laughs> <laughs> live performances, I played live one time, and that was back in 1990. I'm sorry, 2004, at uh, the when I was on the Middle Pillar Presents label. Um, for their Christmas party. <clears throat> and uh, then I would love to do more, um, certainly, now with the Lovecraft stuff. I would, I would love to do that. It also uh, struck me, Jason, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it struck okay. me that, uh, uh, you know, my son is designing a Call of Cthulhu campaign right now. Mm. I think you're going to be uh, one of the players, Ben, if I remember correctly. Um, and it just struck me as this your music would be such a nice background yeah. to that gaming you know well, also, i hear a lot think, of that do well, you, don't you think good. like yeah. uh it, it seems to me like this would be perfect for the next necronomicon convention in right. uh, 2021 because they have so many different live performances of music that's true you just well, ask Niels about it i uh, jason's uh, probably going to mention this but jason actually was on a panel that even discussed this correct Yes, and that was at the last Necronomicon, and then I also uh, actually designed and released an album f- that was released like specifically for uh, Necronomicon 2013, um, which was the uh, Naralithotep uh, piece, uh, So Comes the Yawning Darkness, and that was for that particular one, and this time I just uh, promoted the, the Robert Chambers uh, album, uh, Where the Black Stars Rise. Uh, I'm just I'm just looking up your Bandcamp page here. Um, you've got uh, you've got quite a few albums out, right? Um, yeah. How many total? Well, nine of them so far, and then of course in the works right now is the continuation of the uh, Mountains of Madness exploration with a project called the Elder Ones that uh, I've been strewn has been strewn about uh, the internet this week. Um, and that's just a ex, an exploration from the ground floor of the uh, the Earth history of the Elder Things from at the Mountains of Madness. Uh, this looks. Uh, I wasn't fami- too familiar with Bandcamp, but I'm, I'm on your site now. I clicked on uh, Where Black Stars Rise, um, and yeah, this is pretty simple. You can buy the digital album for nine nine nine, folks, and you've got a sample there called the Yellow mm-hmm. Sign Cat. Mm-hmm. I know you're listening um and watching so yeah i just did this myself um to the audience all you've got to do is just google uh the unquiet void and Bandcamp, and it'll 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 take you right there and it it truly jason i uh i wouldn't have you on the show if i didn't like the music but i want to really emphasize how much i like it i think it's very very atmospheric um so and I, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought that it would be a good background to call it Cthulhu games because it, it it certainly would be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, one time after um, the the follow up to Poison Dreams, the Shadow Haunted Outside, and that was uh, sort of yeah. Well, I'm not going to talk about that one right now, but uh, someone actually sent me a picture of uh, the altar that he built out <laughs> in his backyard where he uses that album in his old one summoning rituals and i wish i was kidding um oh, wow. i'm not and i never kept i didn't keep the pictures and i'm sorry um, truth is, is stranger than fiction right yes it is <laughs> <laughs> yes it is so well thank you for coming on are you gonna stick around while we talk to mary and other, oh, other yeah. things or do you, do you need to run no, I, okay. I can stick around for a bit. And if I could just add one thing. If, yes, please. If people pick one album 
Um, I highly recommend uh, Secrets of the Vanished Eons. Am I saying that right, Jason? Yes. And so it's based on At the Mountains of Madness. And I don't know how to explain this, but you listen to it, you start feeling cold. It's just like the, the liner notes are amazing. Um, I probably listen to this album like three or four dozen times, like when I'm working on stuff at work, driving, anything. It's really worth it. Um, I got to meet Jason at Necronomicon this past year. Uh, he and his partner are quite amazing. Um, it's really this music. It's if you like dark ambient stuff, I promise you're gonna love it. Uh, I Joe do. Pulver, <laughs> yeah. I, I get the feeling Thank that Joe Pulver is forced to listen to it on a fairly regular basis <laughs> uh, in his current situation. Probably, so. probably. But you're gonna get better. Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, we miss Joe. All right. Well, thanks, Jason. Um, I'm gonna, and I'm glad you're sticking around for the remainder. Uh, again, just uh, Google uh, the Unquiet Void and uh, Bandcamp. It'll take you right to it. So oh, apparently, Joe loves the music. Cat uh, just made clear to us in the chat. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you, so Joe. You also of have the of Joe course, Cole he does. <laughs> um, okay, so Mary, uh, you're an author. Can you tell us a little bit more about you, and then? maybe lead into this article and why you wrote it and talk about women in horror month. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, it, like Jason mentioned, I always loved monster stories. And when people used to ask me, what do you write? I used to tell them I wrote monster stories. Cause to me, that was, to me, horror can be cathartic, but I mean, it's essentially a form of entertainment and the, real life kinds of horror, you know, the stuff with serial killers and, and people who are just brutal, like mean people doing meaner things to even meaner people. It's, it, it, there is definitely a place in the genre for it because it makes a lot of social commentary and uh, I think does make people aware of certain societal or politi you know, social and political ills. But as far as entertainment goes, monster stuff was always fun for me. And then when I started writing it, I realized that uh, really monsters represent a lot, for the most part, they represent certain psychological aspects of our character, which can be absolutely terrifying. And as I started publishing books, other people started saying, oh, so you must like Lovecraft, right? You must like cosmic horror. And I'll be honest, you know, when I first started writing, I hadn't really read much of uh cosmic heart and when i but when i started reading lovecraft i was like yes this is it this is exactly my yeah. wheelhouse in terms of yeah. things that i like to write things that i like to read to me this is uh there's something both terrifying and thrilling and fun about a lot of the concepts that uh appear in cosmic horror uh, more so i think to me for me personally than in other subgenres. so uh I started reading a lot of Lovecraft, and then I started reading a lot of the uh, writers that Lovecraft liked to read, or people who were either contemporaries of Lovecraft or w were mentored by Lovecraft. Uh, like Ramsey Campbell is, I think, who I'd like to be when I grow up. <laughs> you know, like he's just, his work is just great, and uh, because he has that, he's managed to find that sweet spot, that middle ground between things that are terrifying and things that are fantastical. And that's kind of what I try to do in my work. I try to I try to make the unreal feel real, but still keep a bit of the, the magic of the fantastical in it. And I try to write stuff that scares people uh, because to me that's the most fun kind of horror is the kind of horror that makes you want to uh, turn the light on or look behind you when you're you know alone in the house and one of the things that I found is that women, I don't want to say that they're better suited to write cosmic horror because I, I don't really believe that that's an issue either way. Uh, but I do believe that they are in some ways uniquely suited to write cosmic horror. I mean, if you, if you look at the idea of, uh, and, I, and, and, and I hesitate to speak for newer generations of women, but I feel like women you know, of my generation, maybe of, uh, you know, an older generations, for the most part, we're taught to be afraid of everything. Uh, we were taught that, you know, as little girls, we're, 
we're what predators are, are looking for, like the bad strangers are, are going to try to kidnap you. Um, you know, men are going to want certain things from you and they may not be nice about trying to get it or, uh, you know, you shouldn't go anywhere alone at night because you're a woman, things like that, you know, where you, you get this sort of ingrained concept of fear. I also feel that the way women function, for the most part, um, and again, I'm making sort of generalities here, and I so I apologize to anyone that this doesn't really apply to, I feel like men are very logical, straightforward creatures. They, and, and part of it is that they're, they're taught to do that they're, they're taught to think things through they're taught uh you know here's a problem we have to find a solution and i think that despite their feelings they feel that it is somehow irresponsible to let feelings get in the way of their decision making process um and i i've seen that chart starting to change over time as social and gender roles seem to be uh less rigid than they used to be when I was growing up. But and along the same token, I think that uh, of that generation, women were taught that any decision, any important decision that you're making involves as much uh, how you feel about something, how you think others will feel about something, and what like your gut instinct is as anything intellectual. Those things all carry equal weight when you are uh, when you're making decisions. And I think that that's, if there, if there can be said to be a difference between uh, how men write and how women write, I, I think it's that uh, sometimes that comes into play. Sometimes women write about certain complexities of their decision-making process. Now, I also think too that uh, the hero's journey as we know it uh, in fiction, generally comes from from a, a male standpoint in that um you have a character who starts out being an individual you know he's somebody you know he's you know like a, a farmer somewhere or you know a hobbit or you know like a, or a landowner somewhere and he has this responsibility thrust on him and his story arc the the, the character development is him going from being who he understands himself to be to a role where he is responsible for or the hero to other people and and that there's a certain um growth and maturity and and heroic development in learning to be responsible to other people whereas women traditionally have always been taught that we are a function of someone else that we exist because of our role to someone else we are someone's daughter we're someone's mother, we're someone's wife or girlfriend. Mm. And I Great think, point. thank you. I think the mistake that a, a lot of people make in trying to maybe, you know, remake something with a woman instead of a man is that our hero's journey doesn't work the same way. We go almost the opposite way. We have to learn to go from being somebody something to discovering who we actually are as ourselves. And, and who, you know, what role do we play when we're not beholden to anybody else but ourselves? And I think that the, the, the movies, like say The Descent, you know, I think is a great example of a hero's journey that works for women the way women's hero journeys work. Um, but what the interesting thing I found with cosmic horror is that, uh, you know, there's that aspect in cosmic horror of um, a nihilism, that, that the humanity in, in and of itself means nothing, it's insignificant. Right, and right. I, I know I'm sort of being sort of glib here, but women are kind of taught <laughs> that they're insignificant in the grand scheme of things. So it's kind of natural for us to uh, reframe our significance in a story. And I think a lot of modern cosmic horror, I'm coming to find, you know, having done the podcast and, and whatnot, that a lot of what modern cosmic horror does is it acknowledges, yes, you know, in the face of this grand monstrous thing, humanity may seem insignificant, but it is the nature of humanity to find some reason to keep going, to find significance in something. And uh, I think that just sort of uh, dovetails nicely with the way that women write horror, because we are kind of looking for a reason to be as individuals. And I think cosmic horror does that. 
it, something you just said reminds me of a, uh, a show I really like, Angel, which is a spinoff of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, a scene in the second uh, season where he says, where he kind of realizes that nothing matters, mm -hmm. and he says to his friend, "If nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we do." You know, treating people exactly. with kindness and so on and so forth. If if everything is meaningless, then as he says, an act of a smallest act of kindness is the greatest thing in the world. So, and that's a perfect way to look at it, really, because I think that's I think a lot of modern cosmic horror, and I and I, I know I do it in my stuff too. Uh, that's the point: is that if nothing matters, then what does matter are the few things that we would choose to be choose to be insignificant for like you'd risk your life to save your child right or to save someone you love in fact i i dare say i think most people would probably risk their lives to save the planet if that's what it came down to and you know i i think that you know in the face of of maybe these little acts meaning nothing in the grand scheme of the universe they still mean something to us right. you know right your article, this is the the Bronzeville Bee, um, dated February the 6th. Please do correct me if I'm misunderstanding this. But in reading the article, and I did, I loved the article, that's why I wanted you to be on the show, um, it seemed to me that you were simultane simultaneously saying it's great that we have a Women in Horror Month, and at the same time I'm frustrated that we have to have a Women in Horror Month. It, do I... Do I, did I understand what you're trying to say correctly? That's absolutely true. The thing is, is I don't, I don't want to come across as being ungrateful that people do go to such lengths sure. to acknowledge us. Because the truth of the matter is, is women have always been writing horror. Um, we have not commercially taken up a uh, majority of the of the you know writers out there like most of us i think even now it's only something like 20 to 40 percent of horror writers are women but we've always been doing it and i think we're, we're finally entering into a time where uh we're recognized for doing it the same way that men do i think a lot of people in the past i know i, I ran into this a lot when i first started uh they assumed that because i was a woman that the horror that i wrote wasn't really horror it was paranormal romance or it was dark fantasy or it was something that would not be scary because I'm a girl and I, I think that people are finally starting to see that there is not it, there's not that much of a difference other than you know as I mentioned before maybe our perspective there isn't that much of a difference between a woman writing horror and a man writing horror if a woman's going to write paranormal romance she's not calling it horror anymore you know I think right. a lot of women generally tended to gravitate toward those uh, subgenres because they were accepted more easily and more readily than in straight up horror. But a lot of women today are writing, you know, scary horror fiction that is not, uh, it doesn't really fall into those subgenres that romance can really claim at all. There's no romance in it. It's, it's straight up horror. Uh, and one of the nice things I've noticed in you know the last 10 years or so is that you know women in horror month does try to spotlight women uh, that are writing all these different you know subgenres of horror that uh, a broader audience would like the thing is though and and, and, I, it's, and like I said I don't want to appear ungrateful it means so much to me that people are making these efforts that they are mentioning you know mentioning us and talking about us and trying to talk up interest in our books but it's almost always just in february sometimes in october you know because we write hard but it's almost always just in february and it is also almost always framed in this uh you know, concept that like these are women horror writers. Let's talk about women horror writers that we like. Let's make an effort to read more women horror writers. And I would just like us to reach a point where that qualifier doesn't need to exist. That yeah. uh, people would say, "All right, let's make our top ten list of horror horror authors that we like," and it's both men and women on there. And that doesn't seem weird. I just think naturally, and not not because exactly. they're ticking off boxes. 
Right. I, I think that the fact that it still seems to be a novelty, um, and partly maybe that's just my own impatience. I mean, I have seen, in, in the 20 years that I've been doing this, I've seen, you know, massive change. I mean, I, I've, I, I've had publishers come up to me when I first started and like literally try to trade sex for, you know, publishing contracts. I mean, it kind of doesn't get more like uh, sexist than that, you know? Uh, and and I've gone to see like, you know, new generations of writers who list women as the kinds of inspirations to their writing that say Stephen King was to us. Uh, so, or, you know, Lovecraft or, or Ramsey Campbell or, or anyone else, like we're starting to see women uh, as not just like, oh, well, these are the women writers I like, these are the writers I like. And that's, that's the progression I want to see. And as I mentioned in this article and somewhat in the article that uh, preceded it, I think that the best way for women to do that is to really look at the, the, the realism of the business, which is that it's a business and that businesses want to make money and that it's natural for a publisher to want to hire writers to work with who have name recognition because they bring in fans uh, who can, you know, they've worked with them before so they know that the person can do the job that they're given and that they can do it on time and, you know, turn in the project when they need it. And so I think that traditionally, because men have been doing this commercially longer than we have, men are that group of people that the publishers are looking at or that um, Hollywood is looking to adapt or that uh, you know, readers tend to go to because they've just been around longer than we have. And I think the best way for us to normalize and equalize the playing field is for us to keep uh, producing work, producing it on time, building name recognition, and proving to publishers that we can make them money. And then if we make them money, uh, other people will start to take us seriously too. If readers uh, ask, you know, when is when is the next Mary San Giovanni book coming out? Or if, uh, you know, if if I if a publisher trusts that, okay, you know, I need you to do this comic book adaptation. I need it by Thursday, and no, and they and they know that I will do it when they when they tell me to, and I'll turn in something that they don't have to worry about being a piece of crap. You know, uh, I think that it really comes down to uh, women asserting themselves in a way that shows that we are viable financial uh, producers of work, that we will make the money. And there's there's kind of a tricky balance here. I think the, the way to, you know, break through whatever existing barriers are left is, is really just uh, awareness. It's readers talking about like, hey, I read this great book right, by Mary Santoni. Right. I think you'd love it. Right, you know, right. it's... Um, you know, Hollywood taking a chance on doing a uh, an adaptation of a woman's book and not making a big deal that it's a woman's book, just that, hey, this is a great new horror book, you know. Um, people writing reviews, it's just, I think it's that same thing that men used to build a reputation that we just have to use too, to build the same kind of reputation. Uh, and I think once that happens, we won't need a women in horror month. So it really is kind of a catch-22. We need yeah, it till yeah. we don't need it anymore. You know, you were talking about something horrible a few minutes ago about when you were new to this publishers wanting to trade sex for a book contract and whatnot I made me think of a, 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 it was an interview that I saw about 20 years ago and I don't remember what the context was I don't remember anything except that the actress and uh, she wanted the TV show to continue and Basically, she was just she. It, it, she took it for granted that if the guys in charge pinched her on the ass or something, that she needed to take it to keep things moving forward, or so that the show didn't get canceled and whatnot. And I, I remember feeling so sad about that. Not and not because I know how that feels, because of course I don't. I'm not female, but j sadness that not only is it happening, but she feels like she has to let it happen you know it was it was uh, we used to um it used to be before people were particularly vocal about it and i and again i can understand this when we were trying to get a foothold in the business a lot of women were afraid to say anything yeah. you know yeah. if something bad happened so we used to just warn each other you know like if if we were at a party 
uh, and there was like, you know like a creeper there, somebody who was known to try to take advantage of women if they were drinking or whatever. We'd warn each other, you know. We'd just be like, right. hey, listen, you know, whatever. Just don't be alone with the guy, you know. Rather than make a public, hey, you know, this guy, this guy is dangerous, you know. It was just, it was one of those things where uh, we did let a lot of things slide. We did let a lot of things go, we, you know. I, I think that. And if I can then, just briefly interrupt, uh, please don't. I, I'm not saying that was okay or that mm -hmm. if you if if a, if a woman did let it slide that she was wrong to do so because i can't judge i was i'm not in that position you know oh it, it, it was it's a really kind of a fine line to because it never occurred to us i guess that yeah. uh we were just allowing that behavior to perpetuate you know right. or that maybe we were putting other people in danger by not saying anything that that never occurred to us we thought we were looking out for each other uh i can remember i used to be on erotic horror panels all the time all the time i have in my entire life written one short story i don't even think it was published that was an erotic horror story but i was always on erotic horror panels because i was a woman mm. until i finally said uh on a panel one time, uh, hi, I'm Mary San Giovanni. I have no idea why I'm on this panel except for the fact that I have boobs. Mm -hmm. As, because I don't write, I don't write hard, <laughs> I don't write erotic car, so I don't know why I'm here. And I think it was just enough shame that nobody's ever put me on an erotic car panel again. But uh, it, it's little, you know, it's it, it's an evolving process. And I was, you know, I'd say I was so so lucky that I had so many men who were supportive and they were they did treat me like an equal and they did when they saw some type of injustice you know they they beat it down like it, they they really went out of their way to try to make this as safe and equal and fair a playing field as they could and i feel sorry for women you know particularly maybe in generations before me who i don't think had that kind of support and it really i think heartens me to see you know, men of, of all different generations nowadays fighting so hard to make sure that we understand that we're not, uh, you know, any legacy that we have isn't being swept under the rug and that the work that we're doing matters. Because, you know, I mean, writers know this is this is a lonely, you know, isolating kind of business. And one of the um, one of the things that make you feel like validated, I think, is that people out there appreciate what you're doing, that they're reading your books and that their books are resonating with you. And I think the more obstacles we can eliminate that don't need to be there, like, well, I'm not going to read your book because, you know, it's a woman's name on the cover. Right, so it can't right. be scary. Or, um, yeah, no, I, 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 oh, I used to get like, a, <laughs> well, you don't look like a horror writer. You look like a romance writer. I'm not sure what that means. It means, um, it means you're female and that's the way, yeah. I, I, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. And so the more of those things that, and a lot of that has been eliminated, you know, I, I like I said, I, I think I've really been very fortunate to have, I, horror always, has always been pretty good about that. I think that um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the, the men that I've uh, learned from, you know, a lot of men taught me the business, they taught me how to write, they taught me how to negotiate, and they fought for me when I wasn't comfortable with fighting for myself. And I really appreciate that, you know. So to me, I, I mean, I don't, I would never want to see the tables turned and see, um, you know, men treated badly or have the legacy that they essentially built commercially uh, undercut in any way. Uh, but I do, I would like to get to a point where the fact that some writers are men and some writers are women doesn't matter. It's the fact that these are people producing horror out there and it's made the genre so much richer for it. Ben, you have a couple of questions for Mary? Yeah, so uh, first I just want to bring up real quick what some people have said in the YouTube chat, and they pointed out that modern horror was basically created, uh, well, I don't want to say created, but the first big modern horror novel was actually written by a woman, Mary Shelley. Yeah. And this idea that in the, you know, before, like when you had, you know, the only real horror being made was gothic, um, you know, gothic fiction right that was also mostly by women for women so it's kind of interesting how in the 20th century that all went away and the focus became on you know fiction by men for men regarding horror um whereas opposed to say you look at the crime and mystery fiction genre right 
where you had really prominent, uh, amazing, best-selling authors in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s and on and on and on, you know, Agatha Christie and mm-hmm. and all these writers to this very day. And so the mystery genre has kept women, I don't want to say as the the biggest name, so to speak, but certainly it's a lot easier probably for a woman to sell a mystery novel about a detective than it is a horror novel that's not paranormal romance or or what have you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, to, to address both points, definitely, women have always been writing horror. The thing is, is that I think commercially, for some reason, women weren't always considered... I, I think because the two main breakout commercial novels were both written by men. I also tend to think that the uh, that gothic tradition, that sort of uh, mystery, for some, rather than ghost stories sort of segueing into horror, I think a lot of that gothic tradition segued into mystery and thrillers. I've noticed even um, my last few books, I had a series, a Kathy Ryan series, where she's sort of this, I don't know what she's, a, she's an occult, uh, like uh, not not quite a detective, but like a consultant for for police uh, police forces and things like that. And she almost exclusively deals in cosmic horror situations that people don't know what to do with. Um, but those were marketed as supernatural thrillers. And I think it was probably a combination of the fact that women are more accepted by a wider audience in thrillers and also that uh, a lot of the big publishers at the time still balked a little bit at the horror label and they said it they said the books would sell better as a thriller and i told them you know you can you can market it under any genre you like to as long as i can keep getting checks to cash and all this. so um, <laughs> and but i, I think, think that, that was the case i think that touches on your point earlier that and you know any woman that let's say um a woman did want to make a living in the 1950s mm-hmm. as a writer and they had this great idea for a horror novel and then they realized well you know if i make this a thriller with mm-hmm. a, a detective and kidnapping and all this stuff i can get my book published right or i can do this other thing and the publisher is going to ignore me and um, i you saw something similar in the science fiction genre where women had to write under men's names mm-hmm. if they could even get away with that and this is something we touched on last week with people of color having the same problem where it's so hard for a person of color to kind of break into writing horror because all the publishers are white men. Mm-hmm. And it's not that they're actively like, I don't want to publish a novel by someone of color, but they're not even looking at it. Yeah, I, I think and I think, again, it comes down to uh, it comes down to business. It comes down to money. I think that for the most part, the people who established uh, financial feasibility in the commercial market of horror were white guys, and uh, it's it, you know I think old old habits die hard. I think they've developed enough of a reputation that um, the biggest producers, more or less, of horror fiction are primarily men. They're the ones that re- like ha- are household names, uh, other than Anne Rice. And to me, Anne Rice tends to write paranormal romance, I think, more often than horror. Yeah, but I, think I mean, Anne Rice is really yeah. right. I, she's she's one of the few, I think, women horror writers that you could consider a household name. Um, and again, because of what she does write, I think that sort of typifies to people what women's horror is like, and it's not an accurate representation of the big picture. Yeah, so I, I mean, think I, until I like we've been that. around, right? Until we've been around long enough that we've established ourselves the same way under more or less the same principles that men have established that they can, you know, do good work, do it on time and make money for the people that are hiring them. Uh, I think that's basically what we need to do to kind of even things out. And and my last thing is I, I think sort of the current environment we have now, there's some things that are very helpful. You have social media, you can help promote your work. You can create groups. If people are looking specifically for women writing horror, there's ways to do right. that. But I also worry that both sides of sort of the political spectrum have sort of poisoned social media in a way. So you have these men who um, they're angry. They think that for every female writer that takes over, that means one less man is writing Mm -hmm. somehow. And you also have people on the opposite side of the spectrum where, okay, you're allowed to write horror, but how dare you write a Lovecraft story because he was a misogynist and a racist. And that therefore makes you a misogynist and a racist and you're a turf or, or whatever attack they want to throw out there. And I kind of, um, we see this a lot. We discussed this last week, last week, Mike's familiar with it, the young adult fiction 
where just it's oh, yeah. almost like you can't yeah. do anything without getting, getting attacked yeah. anymore. Yeah. So it's I huge I was, minefield, I think. Yeah. So I was going to ask how how do you navigate those sort of things? I, I mean, because you you can't just abandon social media. You need to participate in it to otherwise no one will ever know you're writing. But at the same time, there's danger there, I guess. Well, th see, the thing is, I think with social media, and I think with the internet evolving from communities like message boards to almost like these little kingdoms of one, uh, promotion has become as much about who you are as the creator as it's been about what you're producing. And I try to steer away from that. I, I said um, in one article that I don't, who I, who I am, of course, it matters to me, it matters to the people who love me, um, and it matters to the people I love, but I would rather, um, I'd rather have a, rep a reputation with the readers for what I've done, uh, for what I've accomplished, what, the things that I have no control over, the things I was born as, I, I was born as a woman, I was born with brown eyes and brown hair, you know, I was born straight and white, you know, um, I can't control those things. I don't want anyone to judge me for controlling for, for things I can't control. So it seems to me both unwise and unfair to judge anyone else on those things. And that includes straight white guys. You know, um, I have a lot of respect for the people who built the business that I love the, the, the genre that I love. And that's a, a lot of them are, you know, straight white guys. And I'm okay with that. I think that luckily my, social media politics I can be fair I can be fairly honest with them I I, I tend to be somewhat uh, equalitarian I guess sort of a, a, a middle ground where um, I would like to see everyone have a fair shake and I I'd, I'd, I'd like to to appreciate and acknowledge the accomplishments of everybody but in a, in a genuine way and not in a sort of placating way like I really uh, I think it's it's as important to sort of temper our anger with social politics and with people who disagree with us and try to appro approach things in a diplomatic way, especially on social media. Um, because again, ultimately this is this is a business. And I'm not looking to I mean if, if readers if readers have wildly different politics than I do and disagree with me or if they believe in stances that I don't agree with that's okay if they enjoy my books and I'm writing books that 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 they like to read okay I mean I can I can accept people having different viewpoints than me as long as those viewpoints aren't going to hurt me or the people I love you know um, and as far as Lovecraft goes I mean the man was the godfather of monster horror. He was the godfather of cosmic horror. And I think that's an undeniable thing. The fact that he had some absolutely repugnant views about people outside of his little safe New England bubble, I think is partially due to uh, his his experiences as a kid. I mean, my understanding was that he, he had some... Um, mental illness in the family. Um, I think he had a very sheltered life. I think he was xenophobic in a lot of ways. I do think he had some racist views that went above and beyond the times, but I don't think that anything that he's done that's so abhorrent is something that should completely negate his contribution to the genre. It's just... Uh, I, I think that, you know, as time goes on, you know, generations of people are going to find the behaviors of, of people in the past barbaric. And the best thing that that can do is inspire us to be better people in the future. You know, um, I also think that one of the, the great things that we can do to honor the people, because I mean, my understanding too, is that Lovecraft didn't like women or Italians. So I had two strikes against me, against me. So uh, but I can still appreciate his work and I can still take all the things that I don't like about his beliefs and subvert them in my own work and still have it be cosmic horror and hopefully speak to um, both the, the tradition that Lovecraft established that I think made him 
so influential while still embracing a future that includes rather than excludes the people he didn't like if that makes sense yeah i i have a question for you but before i ask uh bridget you've been so quiet the whole time that <laughs> the people who are just listening don't know you're here do you want to <laughs> do you i don't want to i don't mean to put you on the spot but do you have do you want to contribute to any of this right now or or gosh um I didn't really and how how is your neck? How are you feeling? <laughs> it's sore. And, but I'm yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't really have any question per se, but just um, a comment to what Mary was saying that um, the um, that happens a lot in music as well. Is that you know, as a female writer of music, it's like, oh, you're you must write pretty music, you know, it mm-hmm. can't possibly be anything that's atonal or challenging or anything like that so I you know just commenting to that (laughs) I think they think we lack a certain substance sometimes that that maybe women are too our sensibilities are too delicate to be able to delve it but women women deal with some of the most brutal ugly violent vicious truths in the world I mean childbirth alone is a very messy and painful process we're no strangers to you know the stuff that gets you in the gut so yeah but i but you're right i've seen it in music i've seen it in um movies in directing and acting uh comic books video games and i think you know bringing awareness to it but bringing awareness to it in a way that is both firm and assertive and still diplomatic without isolating the people who truly are on our side right i think is is the way to sort of counteract that personally yeah, there seems okay. to be a big lack of, of nuance sometimes out there. Yeah. Can I, I have a question then? Yeah. Because um, one of the things that you keep coming back to, uh, Mary, is uh, the business aspect. And yet my impression is that over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of the publishing world has had the legs kicked out from under it um, with the decrease in popularity of paper books. Uh, an overall decrease in reading in the public to some degree you know book and mortar bookstores uh, brick and mortar bookstores are uh, almost a thing of the past sometimes it seems and a lot of people are having to get by with self-publishing or trying to promote promote like uh, Kindle works where they're only getting like uh, pennies in terms of royalties I was wondering how has that affected uh, say a young woman wants to get into writing these days um, it's it just seems to me the models that we've all anticipated are going to be there are just disappearing like smoke in the wind one of the things I have told um, women writers newer women writers who've asked me is that being flexible and being aware of how published how the publishing landscape changes over time is absolutely essential to men or women who want to stay have staying power in this business um, in some ways we would have thought ebooks would have made things cheaper I mean the overhead is different if it's an ebook you're not you know warehousing all these paper books you're not paying printing costs and paper costs and um, what I think though that it's done is that it's put a little bit of a hurt on traditional publishers because I think a lot of writers are seeing well I can cut out all the middlemen that were always essential in this business. I can cut out agents. I can cut out traditional publishers. I just put the book out myself and keep all the money. The problem with that is that, in my experience, uh, self-publishing is only really an effect, a financially effective business model if you have a fan base already. If you have, if you're somebody like, say, Brian Keene or Hello. Brian Smith. Or, uh, or you know, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, any other, if they wanted to self-publish, their fans would flock to them and, and they could get away without those middlemen and keep all that money. They could have a more lucrative business uh, self-publishing than publishing with traditional publishers uh, or with agents who, t- you know, they all take a cut. For somebody like me or for somebody, you know, even newer who's starting out, it is very hard to get noticed because the other thing that self-publishing and uh, you know, all these self-publishing models has done is it has made it so much easier to publish a book that the market is more or less glutted with all of these people putting books out and it is very difficult 
it's short of like gaming the Amazon algorithms, it's very difficult to be noticed above and beyond other people out there who are all doing the same thing. So my advice has always been, if you're going to, if you really want to have security, then you have to diversify. You have to write, you know, fiction. You can, you could novel writing can be your great love, but you should not be against the idea of taking comic book jobs or nonfiction jobs. Uh, you write manuals, you write the labels on soup cans, whatever people are willing to pay you for to write it, you write it and that's that's you know income coming in and it's constantly I mean it's still writing so you're constantly honing the craft anyway and it, it is it is putting you out there as prolific enough that when people plus you're plus you're touch you know you're touching several different uh, media aspects of you know of the genre so uh, I'll, I'll give you an example I was um, I had done some ghostwriting work. Some I did some comic book work for DC. I wrote a Wonder Woman story. Then I did some ghostwriting uh, graphic novel work. And because of those two things, uh, Rich Chismar contacted me and I, I adapted one of his novellas, uh, Widow's Point, for a graphic novel. Um, I think that he was aware that I could even do that because I was trying different things outside of my comfort zone. I was trying you know, comic books and graphic novels and short stories. And, um, and I've put it out there, like, I'll, I'll try any kind of writing project, as long as, you know, as long as the pay is okay. And, you know, I'm not, you know, and it doesn't violate any like major moral principle, you know, uh, I, I'd be willing to try almost any kind of writing project, because I think diversifying is important. I think it's important to publish with more than one publisher. I think it's important to use more than one publishing model, do some traditional publishing, some self-publishing, some small press, because any in in my experience, anytime you put all your eggs in one basket, that basket inevitably collapses, and it sets you back by at least a year, if not more. I, I really hope a lot of uh, uh, female writers, especially new, newer female writers, but maybe not necessarily, are l listening now or in the future because. Uh, you've got a lot of great advice for them. I'm just sitting here uh, marveling at it. Um, my only question is, well, I have two questions. You mentioned if you have a following, or who's this Keen guy? You, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> he's <laughs> he's this hack that I know. Oh, oh okay, all right. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, speaking of Brian and, and probably others, uh, this was one of my questions that I had written down to ask you. You meant, you were talking about this uh, earlier about men who have helped you. What, mm -hmm. what, what, what would you suggest to men, whether they're editors, writers, small press press publishers, whatever, to what can they do practically to help women? Uh, achieve what you're talking about where uh, um, uh, w women in horror month is lo no longer necessary that sort of thing there are a couple of things uh, I, again I appreciate the efforts people have made so far yeah, um, yeah, yeah. one thing that say publishers can do um, is I know that there's there's an attempt to to be diverse to look outside of the normal group of people that you would uh, ask to do work for you um, but women, and I, I suspect people of color and, and, you know, people of varying orientations, I suspect that there is, because I know there is for women, that little part of us that says, are you putting us into this anthology because we're the best that you found in this diverse group of people? Or are you putting this in because you need a token woman? Right. And I, I think the best way to eliminate that and therefore to encourage more women to say approach you is to find a diverse enough group of people that you can be comfortable as a, as a publisher, as an editor, that you are the picking the best of the best from the most varied and diverse group possible. Because then you kind of, you know, kill two birds with one stone. We know that you are actually acknowledging that we're out there. And uh, we also can rest assured that, you know, we gave you something we think is our best and you picked it because you think it's one of the best and not just because a woman wrote it. Yeah, this um, is um, something I was pretty nervous about, Mary. Um, 
when I have my podcast hat on. You know, I've had some some great female panelists in the past, like S. P. Muskowski uh, and Livia Llewellyn, and so on. Um, Heather Landry is a current one, but she's just a very very busy lady, so she doesn't get to come on as much as much as she would like. Uh, I appreciated what S. P. wrote um, that she loved being on the show, and the only reason why she quit was because she wanted to spend her Sunday afternoons writing and not doing this. <laughs> and I, 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 I totally get where she's coming from. But at the same time, I, what I had been doing was been, I had been reaching out to women that I respected um, and saying, you know, in an email, for example, in private and saying, hey, do you want to be on the show? Um, you know, I really like you and I like your work. I love your opinions and so on and so forth. And it was always this I would love to but it would be too much of a commitment for me so then you know recently I made the leap to I I put it out there uh, for everyone to see look I you know I really want uh, to diversify here and I've, mm -hmm. I've tried it this way and now I'm going to try it this you know this way because I don't want to be seen as or even or or do not just be seen as or do be taking off a box um, right exactly but it's just that I want more varying opinions uh, female opinions male opinions um, you know Marvel versus DC opinions Rick you know all this all this kind of stuff um, you know and like Bridget's new on the panel here and you know she was talking last week and I was just sitting there thinking god I'm glad she said yes to be out on the panel <laughs> so because well, you know I, think, I love what she was saying so I, I think we would appreciate that call for diversity you know um but like like when you asked me to be on tonight you said I read that article I really like that article would you be willing to talk about it that meant a lot to me because basically what it said was that a piece of my work had had gotten your attention yeah. And it sort of, you know, it, it does sort of alleviate that fear that like, um, you know, what if what if people are only asking to interview me because I'm a woman? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's the kind of stuff that men can do. I think that um, one one of the things I, I, I've seen uh, men do that I, I find very helpful is just to talk about, um, you know, women, women's books that they read that they like without really bringing up that they're women you know uh, one newer author um, who's who's gotten you know very popular lately Wesley Southern uh, he does that and I, I always thought that was kinda it's just so cool you know like he'll talk about like oh you know when I, I what inspired me to write this book were you know this book by this person this person this person and this person and some of them are women just like and, and it's no big deal you know it's just it's brought up in the in the you know or, or he'll say oh I read this you know and he'll list like you know three new novels that he read and and some of them are by women you know and it's i think it's this idea of normalizing us maybe that legitimizes us uh and and also i think just um and i know i, t I tell women to do this but i guess men can do this too is when there's something that we do that's impressive <laughs> i know that sounds terrible but like if we no, get, it, like, it doesn't a, actually no. a, a starred review in publishers weekly or if um we make a top 10 list in a very very prominent place or we sell to a big publisher to just do little social nudges that make that visible to people because what those things say you know like if women win awards you know um rather than drawing attention attention to oh hey look at you know this woman who won this award uh if we say hey look at this writer who won this award yeah. Then it just kind of, you know, it, it it shows people like, oh, hey, you know, women are doing those same impressive things that men are doing at the same level that men are doing them. And I think it just it sort of like I said, it just sort of legitimizes us by normalizing us as part of the whole machine. Yeah, because like when when people ask me, uh, who are who are some of your favorite horror writers? Exactly. One, one of the names that just jumps right to the top of the list is uh, Susan Hill for me. Mm -hmm. um you know i just she, oh man some she writes some very very quiet horror creepy scenes mm -hmm. um oh i love that i should check out her stuff then yeah kathy koja you know same same mm -hmm. thing um but yeah i didn't think about the fact that oh i'm i'm 
I'm checking off a female writer. I mean, it was just that I love what she does. Um, right. And as a side, she's the one who wrote the uh, the Woman in Black, which uh, uh, became a couple of movies. Um, oh, okay, yeah, with Daniel Radcliffe, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, just if you if you're gonna check her out, the 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 book of hers that I that's my favorite is uh, The Man in the Picture. Um, okay. Check okay. check that out. It's, we'll check that one out. It's so good. And there's a scene in there. I, I shouldn't say anything at all, but after you read the book, <laughs> maybe shoot me an email and I'll, I will. I'll tell you about that scene. That it's just, it's so so effective and creepy. So she's just so good at that. Um, well, I'll definitely check her out then. That sounds very cool. Yeah. But see, that's that's what I mean. Like the way, I, and and that's the thing. I think a lot of some of it's. I think maybe women's own insecurities that you know we're, we're afraid people are only checking off a box when and, and, and the fact of the matter is i think especially now maybe more than ever um people genuinely are just sort of accepting you know and enjoying work by men and women and that's the progression that's the thing that that i think men can do for us is just to to keep doing that to keep mentioning hey you know i read this book by uh so and so and it was fantastic you know, I would recommend this. Um, I saw somebody on, on, on Twitter the other day said, here are books that I think should be made into movies. It was like, you know, it was a reader who just like enjoyed books and it had both men and women on it. And I just, I thought that was great. This, this idea that um, people are just putting the good word out there that there's all this great fiction to read. And some of it coincidentally happens to be by women. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it certainly I've not come to this. I wasn't, born thinking these things i i've made mistakes i think you know it was six or seven years ago you know when the easing was just you know maybe a couple of years old uh, but it already had a big following and i i i did a blog post and i i i think i did something like my favorite seven or eight horror novels by men and the next next day mm -hmm. i did my my seven or eight favorite horror novels by women um and I wouldn't. Do, I know I wouldn't do that today. Um, right. And I can see now where, you know, maybe my heart was in the right place, but that's mm -hmm. not the way that it should be. It should. And there's just, a, you know, there's so. a tendency to, to to find too if you're doing nonfiction content online. I mean, one of the most popular types of nonfiction content is like those listicles, and you need a common theme that ties things together so yeah, i can understand you know the top five horror w women in horror you should be reading and i'm not gonna lie if i show up on one of those lists i'm, of, I'm of honored to tell <laughs> you know <laughs> i am totally honored that that's the case um and, and you know and i think during women in horror month so long as women in horror month exists it's cool to have those kind of lists i just yeah. i i think it would also be cool if in july you know there was a list that says here are the top 10 books of you know the last decade that i think should be just if you're going to be a horror writer you should have read these books and to have there be both men and women on it and that, to have the women on it not just be the dead ones i think would be <laughs> that would yeah. be progress yeah <laughs> yeah you know like i said my heart was in the right place but i just right. today i would be like okay here are my 10 favorites you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. susan hill would be one of them you know maybe kathy koja for example um I just blanked on a couple of my favorite male authors, but um, that's what I would do today. I would just create a list and right. not really and think about the gender, you know. But I know right. that both genders would be on there. So, Charles Grant, I, that's who I was trying to think of. Charles Grant, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, lo you know, I lo Charlie, love that guy. <laughs> Charlie uh, was my mentor when I first started. Really? I, I wish I could have met him, yeah. He was, he, he reminded me a little bit of George Carlin. Like he had that kind of attitude, that sort of snarky <laughs> attitude. And I can remember, uh, we went to this convention and I, you know, he and I, we, we were still sort of like newly friends. And I said, Hey, Charlie, can I buy you a drink? Cause Charlie never turned down a drink <laughs> and he never turned down a, tr a drink with a woman either. <laughs> so really? okay. I said, uh, I said, can I buy you a drink? So we go to this bar and he and I were both from New Jersey. So that was another sort of bonding thing was that we both lived within like half an hour of each other. And, uh, so we go to this bar and he has a cane. So walking at that point wasn't really all that easy for him. And the bar was closed. 
So I said, well, I said, please, please, Charlie, just have a drink with me. We'll go to the bar way on the other side of the hotel. So I had him hike all the way to the other side of the hotel. We finally sit down at this little table. It's nice and quiet. We order our drinks and an Elvis impersonator comes out as the entertainer. And he looks at me all deadpan and he says, I know where you live. I will get you for this. Oh, my God. <laughs> and that was Charlie. <laughs> like, I planned it. Like, I planned to assault him with yeah. the impersonator and Amen. Okay. Uh, I just love his quiet horror, and Susan Hill is, is the same way, and uh, Kevin Lucia, who's going to be on the show in a, in a couple months, or I can't remember what date right now, but uh, is the same way. Oh, Kevin's um, great, yeah. yeah. I, I love Kevin. Um, so, yeah, okay, so is there anything else before we are off this topic and, and done with the show? First of all, anybody on the panel, please stop me if you have questions. Um, Rick, you have a question? I just want to make a comment. Yes. Uh, uh, the reason why I think women, it took a little while for women to get recognized in horror, but it took a little while for just horror writers to get recognized. That's absolutely at, true. If you look at the pulp writer era in the 20s and 30s, if you wanted to, to live in poverty, be a horror writer. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the, only, the, the only way you could make money is if you broke into Argosy, which occasionally published horror. And one of the standout writers who did that was Frances Stevens, who was a woman, and was able to do what Lovecraft couldn't do, but Robert E. Howard only did was westerns. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you're right. It, I mean, a horror has always been um, kind of the you know a it's seen as maybe a step above porn, <laughs> you know. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I used to push for when I was a board member of the HWA was that I thought one of the ways we could elevate the reputation of horror was to make a push for education. Um, that a lot of the writers in other genres were classically trained, more or less, you know, and I think that led a certain, um, you know, literary... Uh, legitimacy to them. And I, I said, I think uh, it's important that we show this as a, a legitimate brand of literature and not just pulp, which is where it had its roots anyway. And there's nothing wrong with pulp because a lot of great writing is, is in the pulps. Uh, but I, like you said, I don't think it was always considered, I think, it, you know, it, it came from weird fiction and, and dark fantasy and, you know, strange science fiction and Horror itself wasn't even really a, a marketing label till what, like the 70s, the early 70s, and uh, or the 80s. And uh, I think that one, of, it, uh, just like legitimizing women, I think to legitimize horror as a genre, it has to be it has to be seen as being capable of producing literature, which it absolutely has for centuries. Yeah, but you know what you just made me think of, Mary, is is when I was a kid. I mean, like. 1819 um, um, for those so the 1930s are, yes the 1930s <laughs> for those who um, are too young to remember we used to have these places called video stores and you would go in and you would rent a movie uh, on a big cassette tape called a VHS I'm, I know I'm being facetious <laughs> but I, I remember being 17 18 and browsing the horror and feeling kind of embarrassed you know like yes. Oh, I'm, you know, I, is, are the other people browsing in the store think I'm some kind of weirdo because I'm, I, you know, I'm over here looking at Halloween and, and look at the dirty horror movies. Yes, exactly. Not in, yeah. So it, it's not exactly the same, but it's just kind of funny. It's what you made me remember that I haven't thought of in years. Well, I think that <laughs> you know, that's part on... of, there's like this weird disconnect between a uh, horror literature and horror movies that doesn't yeah. seem to exist in other genres. And so I think most people's opinion of horror is what horror movies are. And I have to say, maybe within the last 10 years, we're finally starting to see movies that reflect all of the imaginative and, and subtle and almost like literary influences in horror in the movies too. It's not just, you know, hack and slash kind of, which are fun. I, they are definitely fun in and of themselves, but I don't think that traditionally, up until maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, horror was really representing its literature. 
yeah. the cinema part. You know? well, yeah. I was I was going to say, and I think this touches on a couple of things you said earlier, Mary. One that um, the the porn connection, because with horror films, that was sort of at least starting in I want to say maybe around Hammer. And mm-hmm. on even to this day, like that's one of the things. Like, oh, you go see Friday Thirteenth or Halloween, you're waiting for the the nude scenes, right? right? And right. that was always like, oh, if you're renting Friday the Thirteenth, oh, you're just looking for like the sex scenes, and then Jason will come in and kill the girls. Mm-hmm. And not to mention the fact that most of the the victims are are the females, the women. Yeah, right. and of course they're, um, you know, there's all. I mean, we could do five podcast episodes on what's wrong with that genre and how it portrays people. But I think that also, when it comes to the fiction, it sort of goes back to what you said earlier about women need to prove themselves commercially viable. Mm-hmm. I mean, which is kind of, uh, what is it, the cart leading the horse, sort of. Like, women aren't going to be commercially viable if you don't give them a chance. But exactly. it was the same with all of these genres of fiction. No one took detective fiction seriously until Sherlock Holmes was, you know, selling like crazy in, you know, the late 1800s and early 1900s. No one took science fiction seriously until, I don't know, whatever caused science fiction to take off. No one took fantasy seri- seriously until Lord of the Rings. So, mm-hmm. so you have these kind of major commercial works that show, hey, this can be a genre. And I know Stephen King's talked about this because he's sort of one of the people that made it commercially viable. Right. And then later on, people are like, oh, well, this this brilliant work by so-and-so. Um, but because it, if it doesn't make money, people don't read it and therefore don't discover its literature in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, last but not least, Mary, is there, um, first of all, does it, after I ask this, if anyone else in the panel, on the panel has a final question, please feel free to speak up. But is there something that, okay, so I'm a white male, I'm a straight white male. Uh, is there something that maybe... I should have covered here tonight or something I should have asked that maybe it's not natural for me to ask or I wouldn't think to ask. Do you know what I mean? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think, uh, I think this was, this was great. I think, we, you know, we got to cover a lot of the things that the, the article covered and, and why. And, um, and I, I think it, I, I felt very able to communicate these things without feeling like, you know, I was going to offend anybody or anything, and I think that's what's important. It's just you know providing a, providing an environment where we can have these kinds of discussions and and talk about things, and I think that's really awesome. Okay, now we're getting near the end of the show, but you have not told us what do you suggest we go out and read, or what are the shows that you are enjoying right now, or who are the authors you are particularly enjoying right now? Yeah, and Bridget. For God's sake, would you stop talking so much? <laughs> are, are, are you, are you, you're probably in pain, aren't you? Um, you your a neck. Bit. Um, I'm enjoying yeah. listening. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Just so you know. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, as far as movies, I have an em- embarrassingly low standards. <laughs> I I will you and watch Pete Rollick. Just, I will watch just about anything. And to be fair, I can tell if a movie's bad, but I'll watch it anyway, and it's fun. So um, so so did you like Big Ass Spider? Oh, for God's sake, did you get off that topic? I, no, <laughs> it's a modern <laughs> master. It's like Potemkin. <laughs> we God. used to have these what we called wine and cheese movies, where. Uh, friends would bring over bottles of wine, and we would. I would be in charge of picking the movie, and I would pick the worst horror movies I could find. Like there's a, I think it's an Irish movie called Black Sheep, where literally the sheep launch themselves at people. They're like these weird puppet sheep that like fly at people and attack them. So in other I, words, you were doing Mystery Science Theater 3000. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy that. And I try to foist a lot of that on Brian Keane, who is not as appreciative. <laughs> of such things so but we 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 sort of have this this movie tug of war thing where we try to fo- we try to find movies that the other one will like and some of the ones that have come up uh for me personally that i really enjoyed the endless i thought was fantastic and that's a cosmic horror one and that, it's absolutely... that sounds familiar uh, oh yes i've seen that that's very good oh yeah yeah, yeah. i thought that was wonderful um we watched one actually just the other day called Feedback. It was, I think it's a, a British thriller. It's like mm. a horror thriller. Um, that was good. 
Uh, I want to see Color Out of Space. I haven't seen that one yet. There's a bunch on my queue that I'd like to see. Uh, as far as television shows, the thing that I most, the two things I'm most looking forward to, despite the issues I had with the Haunting of Hill House's ending, the the show's ending. You and I me both. Was, yeah. Right, right. I, it was great. Like maybe I'm until like the last episode or two. Yeah. It had some of the most terrifying writing in television that I have seen in decades. So I am looking forward to season two, although I don't know how an adaption of Turn of the Screw is going to be, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, Just to interrupt, if it's anything like the adaption on The Haunting on Hill House, it'll be absolutely nothing like The Turning of the Screw. Right. And they're just literally <laughs> plugging in names and locations so that you think it's an adaptation. And I, I get the impression that, that that's exactly what they plan on doing. That Because honestly, The Turn of the Screw, I'm not so sure that that can be updated for a modern audience easily. You know, um, but we'll see. I, I mean, like, is it, if it's the same writing team, I'd be willing to give it a shot and see what it is that um, most of the movies that I'm watching now just to find something different are a, like a lot of foreign movies. And to be honest, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I don't remember all the titles. I've got a, um, I've got a Swedish one for you and Brian, if you want. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. it's on Hulu. I'm about a third of the way through it. And it, uh, someone posted about it on Facebook the other day, and I did some research on it. And it's called Annie, Annie Ara. It's A N I A R A. And it's on Hulu if you have Hulu. Um, and it's about this, it, it's about Earth in the future has basically been screwed over, so they're traveling to Mars. This ship is traveling to Mars. And it gets blown off course. Now, that's as far as I've gotten. But here's the interesting thing. I was told that it, there's a lot of cosmic horror in there. And I did a little bit more research here. And I'm, I'm reading a tweet of mine from a couple of days ago. Uh, interestingly, Aniara is an adaptation of a Swedish poem by the same name by Harry Martinson. Quote from Wikipedia. Harry Martinson began to write NER in 1953 following the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons test and inspired by a view of the Andromeda gal galaxy he had seen, which is, of course, the next galaxy over. And then I keep going on Wikipedia. And in 1964, Theodore Sturgeon, quoting again, uh -huh. reviewing uh, a 1964 American edition for, for a genre artist declared that Martins, Martinson's achievement here, and now he's talking about the poem, of course, because the movie just got made. Martinson's achievement here is an inexpressible, immeasurable sadness. It transcends, it transcends, told you I couldn't talk today, panic <laughs> and terror and even despair, and leaves you in the quiet immensities with the feeling, feeling that you have spent time and have been permanently tinted by a larger than uh, God impersonal force. Um, I was like, okay, well, one, I've got to read this poem, and two, I've got to watch this movie. So you, you know, now that you mention it, Brian and I did see that one, and that that description that you just read, yeah, that is exactly that movie. Oh, that's I mean, that's I don't good. want to give any kind of spoilers away because no, it is yeah. really fantastic. It, it's Laird Baron in space. Brian says it's Laird Baron in space. Oh. <laughs> That's a really good point, Brian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is fantastic, and I can see the cosmic horror aspect of it. It is really an impressive, an impressive work. It is. Yeah. Uh, well, I threw that out there because you said you were looking for foreign, but but you beat me to it already. You guys beat me to it. <laughs> but I'm, in, I, I, I'm definitely into it. Yeah. yeah. Trying to find anything, but I've I've found that you know it's interesting culturally. Different countries approach horror in different ways. And yeah. they approach um, almost like the examination of the the value of life in different ways. So it's been kind of cool to see different foreign horror movies and and how they how they look at the things that scare that society the most. Yeah, I was I've uh, I live about an hour from Stanley Peterson, and he loves all kinds of horror movies, and especially Italian. Uh, I think it was yeah Italian, and he was we were watching a movie, and he's like. You know, in American movie, the kids usually not ever gonna die. Mm -hmm. You know, but in Italian movies, everybody's fair game. The three year olds fair game. <laughs> oh you yeah. Know? And yeah. I could see the difference in the culture, like you're like you're talking about. Yeah. Has, has anybody seen Drog? Drog. No. It's I haven't this, even heard of it. 
it's a Scandinavian um, movie. I think it was on uh, uh, Prime Video, but it's a Scandinavian made horror movie. But what's interesting about it is it's set in the Viking times. So you oh, cool. actually see, you know, a Scandinavian's perspective of Vikings. Um, but apparently Drog is like a walking spirit. So just think Vikings and zombies, but it, <laughs> it's a pretty intriguing movie, actually. Oh, that's cool. How, how do you spell Drog to, so we can look the, it up? D-R-A-U-G? Yep. Okay. I only know that because in Skyrim, one of the monsters that you find in the Viking tombs <laughs> is called a Drog. <laughs> Well, um, last but not least, I wanted to mention just a couple of things. Um, speaking of women in horror, um, Ellen Datlow has a book uh, coming out called Final Cuts. Uh, it looks really great. I forget when it's coming out, but I think I think uh, June or something. I'm not. I don't have it in front of me. But in a couple of months, you can pre-order it on Amazon already. Uh, looks really, really good. Um, what else is new? Um, oh, I just wanted to say, Ben, I I like Picard, but we're at the end of the fourth episode, and he's just now hired a ship. Third episode. Third episode. Third? No, fourth. Fourth. Are you sure? Yeah, so... Um, this should have been done. Time. I mean, come on. Third, third episode. A little bit. It was third. 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 So okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This. I'm old, Basically, what can I say? When they put it together, <laughs> they wanted a kind of pilot that was like two hours or something. Yeah. So that's why it's three episodes. But he's like, oh, the first three episodes are the pilot. So when they screened it here in L.A., for example, they showed the first three episodes because that's what starts the plot. Because in 2020, shows don't have individual episodes anymore you right. just watch them into 10 to 15 pieces now mm -hmm. um and that's sort of so we're used when we think of jean-luc picard we think of the classic 80s and 90s period of no episode is a continuation of the episode before it generally unless maybe it's like the season finale season opener everything is an independent episode and because of that the plot has to move at lightning pace because you have 40 whatever it is 42 47 minutes resolve it um picard is telling us what uh, what is it 10 episodes 20, i don't even know how many uh, episodes it is. i don't know i think but it's, a, it's just one story it's, so it's, it's 10 it's 10 yes yeah, so i don't i don't need it to move netflix, fast i just think it's moving a tad slow i agree with you but this is why netflix drops everything at once that's and true and because you're gonna walk like or you do what amazon and hulu do where you drop those first two or three episodes that are the real pilot in order to get that stuff out there so that like you can watch the first three episodes together because if you watch them in one sitting they probably don't feel like oh my gosh it's three weeks and he just now got on the ship are you kidding <laughs> me i still don't know what the plot is really i mean i love the show yeah, that's but, like, true if i was watching find, them, you're right if i was watching them all at the someone. same time i wouldn't be thinking that yeah exactly so i think what happened is but cbs is still cbs they still have that mindset of this is a weekly television series yeah so we're going to drop in an episode every week. And I think either you drop everything at once or you do what Hulu does and you drop the first, or I think Amazon does it for some shows. They did it for Bosch, I think. Which you drop the first two or three episodes. No, Bosch, you get going. the whole season every time. Oh, that's right. So yeah. what am I thinking? Well, at least Hulu, they drop the first couple of episodes to give you that God, that I love kick. Bosch is so awesome. Bosch is one of the best. Uh, I know what I was thinking of is the fourth episode, um, guys, is um, The Outsider. The the, the 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 last episode felt like a lot of filler to me. Um, do you guys disagree or agree, or am I just being crabby? <laughs> well, you know what, Brian and I have it on our queue. We haven't watched it yet, but I was going to say, I think isn't that the one? I, when we when we went to look, it only had six episodes, and we thought, okay, maybe they're only doing it in pieces. Like you know, they do the first six episodes and the next. Because the other thing, so. um, I'll Google, is it, is I'll Google it while you're talking. Next? Okay, because I, I, we weren't sure if that was, like, if we should just wait till all of them are out and watch the whole thing at once, or if that was the whole thing. Because Creepshow, when, when I went to watch Creepshow on Shudder, that was only six episodes, and I kept waiting for, like, the rest of them to come out, and that, apparently that was it. That was that was season one, was just six episodes. Mike, I think the fourth episode was the exposition episode. 
it's in uh, the outside. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was mainly done. I finally got an idea of what's going on with that episode. Okay, I just I just looked it up. It, there's going to be a total of ten episodes on the Outsider. Okay. Um, That's why it may seem slow, but it, yeah, you know, it got us all up to speed on what's going on. Yeah. For the record, I think ten episodes is a good amount to ad- adapt a series. I mean, I think that's like for a single I agree. book. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, with I think with Picard, part of the problem is, like I said, we have something to compare Picard to. We had seven seasons of the next generation which is on literally every streaming service and it just moved so fast and so we're it's 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 a shock to go from that to modern store i say modern storytelling mm. law and order svu is still airing all these you know criminal minds all these these police procedurals still work that same yeah. way but i mean although you, you know, know like criminal minds they do have a overreach overreaching arc each mm-hmm. season but you know what sure. if it was me um if you're asking mary uh for you and brian watch the outsider if i i my personal opinion is and i'm going to try to do this from now on is if you can wait the 10 episodes wait and then binge it i think i, I think that's what we ultimately decided we were going to do is just yeah. um because certain, you know, like you guys are saying, I think it's a different kind of storytelling in television now that yeah. um, they they don't wrap things up episodically. It's not like a X Files Monster of the Week kind of thing. It's a different. And it's almost like um, like Lost used to do that. It'd be like you'd have three or four episodes where you were a little bit confused, and then there'd be an episode that sort of explains everything. You and know, then you'd have three or more, four or more, and then you're, you'd be confused again, and then you have something that explains more. You know what it also reminds me of, now that you're saying all this? Mm-hmm. It reminds me of chapters of a, of a book. It's basically behaving yes. a lot like that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, and that's, you know, that's the thing, too. Like, somebody had asked me, well, you know, what happens if, because people are reading less, they're reading books less, things like that, what happens to us? And I said, well, every entertainment type that involves storytelling involves writer somewhere so yeah. we'll just migrate to whatever the new form of the book is um you know there's uh that company serial box that does uh serialized i think it's like uh it's it's audiobooks but i think it's like ten thousand word chapters i guess basically at a time uh but there's people writing those you know there's people writing for uh you know, for Netflix, for Amazon and Hulu and Shutter, and um, I, I think there's always going to be a need for writers. It's just you know what constitutes a book. I guess maybe over time changes, but I, I don't know. Every you know. time I walk into a uh, Barnes and Noble, it's it's packed. You know, um, human humanity has a lot of uh, a lot of fondness for nostalgia. I don't think books are ever going to go away. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, but I think part of the problem is you know. 50 years ago, what were your options for home entertainment? Yeah, true. And you had magazines, and you had radio, Mm -hmm. and then television comes along, and people are reading less and listening to the radio less because now they're watching TV. And then in the 80s, we had home media come along. And then in the 90s, video games really took off. Yeah, to, to, To answer your unasked question, Ben, when I was young, yes, it was scrolls. (laughs) <laughs> I believe you. But that's the thing is here we are in 2020 and you have, I mean, just browsing the internet is a thing people do still. You mm-hmm. have... There's a lot of great stories on the internet that you can listen to for free. You know, creepypasta, etc. Oh, yeah. There's this podcast that, that we're doing. That's one thing people could be doing instead of reading. There's television. There's, all, I mean, streaming services. There's so much content. You could never watch it. While we're throwing out all this stuff here, um, you guys got, no, I got to throw out Knife Point Horror. It is great. So. so so people are reading less just because there's still only 24 hours in the day. But now there's 10 million times more things that they have access to to consume. So it makes sense to me that, pe- I mean, people are reading less. We say this, but Twilight still sold a trillion books mm. or Fifty Shades of Grey. So there's still some things that are selling. We may not appreciate it, but I mean, Harry Potter sold was it 180 million copies over the seven books, and it's still selling just fine. Well, so she's richer always... than the Queen, so I think she did okay. <laughs> exactly. In the new Stephen King novel, whenever his next one comes mm. out, because he always has the next one coming out, is going to sell millions of copies. Um, I I I'm... can't I I can't wait for that one actually because uh, one of the four novellas in there is a sequel to uh, The Outsider. 
Um, oh, cool. That 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 lady Holly is that, is that her name, Ben? Yeah. Holly Gibney. Yep. Yes. Um, she's um, apparently at the beginning of the novella. She sends um, Ralph this note uh, about I don't I I, I don't remember. There, I think it was E W where you could read the first little bit of the novella and it just I I read it and I was like I wish it was out now. It just it sounds really good. When's so. it coming out? Good question. Um, uh, I want to say October, but I might be misremembering. Please that. don't say uh, uh, October. If it bleeds, let's see if this Google machine will tell me something. Um, While you're Amazon looking that up, though, says May fifth. Oh, oh wow. May. Okay, that's not bad. No. One, one of the things I wanted to mention though is one of the one of the pieces of advice I do give writers is that if you can sell audiobook rights. You know, if you can do it simultaneously with your other publishing, do it. Because I do think a lot of people are reading by listening to audiobooks now. It seems to be a lot more popular than it used to be. For the same reason, Absolutely. I guess, people listen to podcasts and the radio and everything. You're driving, you're working out, you're cleaning, you're doing whatever, and you can have it going in the background. Yeah. And you no longer have to have a book on 20 different cassette tapes. <laughs> right, you have to right. Flip over every half hour. <laughs> now you can actually just. I mean, I can't. I mean, even like Star Wars books are like twenty-four hours of audio. So well, that, that's I can't why they used to. to that that, there's a. That's why they actually used to do abridged audiobooks, yep. and there's a special place in hell for the person <laughs> who thought of abridging audio audiobooks. Oh my look, god! Look, look, I'm not going to give up my cassette versions of the Benicula books. It's just not <laughs> happening. <laughs> All right, well, um, Mary and Jason, thank you guys so much for, for being on today. I really appreciate thank it. You. Um, well, thank you for having us. This was a lot of fun. Um, next week we have Livia Llewellyn. So, um, um, love her. Oh, yes, uh, Matt's got a prize. So remember, if you want to win this biography of Lovecraft by Charlotte Montague, Send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put Montague in the subject line. And if you misspell Montague, he will automatically discount you. <laughs> no, he won't. Um, all right. Well, yep. Livia Llewellyn next week. Um, Mary, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you. Uh, I linked to your uh, books page on your site in the in the show notes here on YouTube, and I'll do the same thing for the audiobooks. Uh, I link to you too, Jason. Um, Thank you. I, I love your music. And um, Bridget, I hope the pain continue, <laughs> starts to lessen for you. But I really appreciate you being on the show. Sure, I'm sure um, I'll next week. Yeah, I've been trying to get rid of Matt, but he just, you know, <laughs> he's just hanging on. So, he keeps... He keeps complaining I don't pay him. I pay you just as much as I pay everybody else to be on this show. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and like I said, Livio Llewellyn next week, and we'll, we'll see you guys all then.